Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Our Saviors Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our Saviors is a congregation of people forgiven in Christ, whose mission is to proclaim the good news and connect faith to everyday life. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us. Our contemporary worship will begin in a few moments. Welcome to worship on this Transfiguration Sunday, one of the Sundays we focus on the epiphany of our Lord up top the mountain. I pray that God's blessing will be upon us all as we are here in the Lord's house this day. We're grateful today to uh, welcome Pastor Renee Spiegel Larson from our Synod office who will be proclaiming the gospel to us today. <laughs> welcome, Renee. And so she will also be hosting uh, the forum at 10 o'clock between services in the gathering place. So she's going to be talking a bit about the call process. The call committee is part of the call process. We're with the Transition Task Force now, but we'll get to the call committee in due time. So that'll be at 10 o'clock uh, today between services. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, Sunday school is at 10 o'clock in the lower level of the church. All children from birth to five, grade five, are invited and encouraged to attend, as you know. We also have volunteer opportunities for everyone, parents, grandparents, members of our congregation, to be part of uh, the fun of this program. Response to our new programming has been overwhelming these last couple of weeks. If you would like to volunteer, please stop uh, downstairs today and visit with the Sunday School team, uh, headed by Janelle Hoven, Kathy Horsted, and Dan Drenko. So we're grateful for their volunteer involvement in our Sunday School. As Wednesday is this coming, Wednesday the 14th, Valentine's Day, of course, uh, services at both noon and 6.30 here in this uh, gathering space. Each Wednesday in Lent will feature a, a traditional soup and bread supper prior to our evening services, which will also be held at 6.40. You're invited to help by donating a loaf of bread to be served at the suppers with the soup. Um, food ministry team is also looking for additional volunteers to help with the food production distribution here at the church. If you'd like to join this team, please uh, sign up in the office. Our Lenten series uh, for the midweeks this year will be from a series called Overheard Conversations by the Cross. This is a wonderful series of uh, dialogues uh, written by uh, Pastor Arden Mead. Uh, they will be engaging for us as we listen to these stories of particular uh, personalities uh, of, the, uh, of the passion. Uh, so those services begin uh, actually on the 21st, those following five Wednesdays uh, of Lent. Come help out when our Saviors assist with the food to you distribution on Thursday the 15th, uh, this coming Thursday at Augustana Lutheran Church. Early bird volunteers will assist from 4.15 until 7.30. Other volunteers will come at 5 until 7.30. Full details and sign-up sheets are available at the Welcome Center. Donations are now being accepted for the our Saviors library book sale. The sale will be held on Saturday, March 2nd, Sunday, March 3rd. Donations of used books and DVDs uh, are now being accepted during the library hours. Proceeds from the sale will support our library. The Augie Hockey Parking Fundraising has been exceptional, a way to raise funds for our youth ministry. We need four volunteers each game to help um, with the uh, collection of the, of the funds. Fridays from, uh, at 5, from 5.15 to 7.15 p.m., and Saturdays from 4.15 until 6.15 p.m. are the hours. There's a sign-up sheet also at the welcome desk if you're willing to participate in that ministry. Finally, each week, members of our Transition Task Force are asking us to consider two questions, aid us in our town hall conversations. You can find copies of these questions each week at the uh, Welcome Center and be able to reflect on those as you plan to come to that town hall the following week. Please pick up a copy of those for yourself. So today, may the game be a good game. May no one get hurt. May the best team win. 
Let's sing. Your name is power. spark of creation, Jesus, the tender flickering flame, Holy Spirit, the passionate fire of God's love. i 
privilege to confess our sins to our God, anticipating his wonderful promise of forgiveness and grace. Please join me. Jesus, you are here in this place. But like new parents, we feel our happiness tempered with fear. Lovely, always lovely. And we want you to be proud of us. Yet we worry we will not love enough or do enough to serve as you deserve. God, you notice our insecurity, and you know how we have proven ourselves imperfect. We do not have the faith in ourselves to feed every hungry child, to listen to every crying voice, to swaddle every cold shoulder because we have failed to share this love before. Yet, you gave yourself to human parents, you called hapless disciples. You entrusted the mission of salvation to imperfect people, and you have called us too. By the time Jesus was born, Jesus already loved us enough to forgive all our sins. People of God, Jesus loves you on the day you do everything right and the day when you undo everything right. Truly, today, God wipes away all your sins. Jesus, with your surprising love, transform our imperfection so we can live for you alone. I'd like to invite all the children to come up. We'll have a little conversation here today about the story in the Bible. All the kids, here they come. <laughs> Good. More kids. There comes one in the back. How are you today? Okay. We got a small group, but we got a good group, right? How's everybody today? Good. Have any of you ever been to a mountain? You know what a mountain is? What is it? It's a big place on the ground. Yeah, it's kind of a very high place on the surface of the earth. It's usually rocks, got trees. Some don't have trees. Today's story from the Bible is about Jesus on top of a mountain. And there were some people there with him. You know, there's the Bible. We got the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Two parts to the Bible. In the Old Testament, two of the people who were with Jesus on the mountain today were Elijah and Moses. They were way back there. They were, they were around thousands of years ago. In the New Testament, there were three people there, Peter, James, and John. And they're kind of the same time that Jesus was born. They were kind of brothers of Jesus almost. And on the mountain, they all went up there. And um, what happened? Anybody know what happened in the transfiguration of Jesus up on that mountain? Jesus was covered with light, like a big flash, and he was and, and he he was he was um, shown to the people or to the world in a way that he had not seen him before. That was what we call an epiphany. He was. The truth about Jesus was, was shown to the people. And Jesus saw Moses and Elijah, who had been way many hundreds of years before him. They were there. And then Peter and James and John were there. And then there was a voice that came down from heaven and said, this, Jesus, this is my beloved son, okay, and whom I, I'm really pleased with him. Listen to him. That was the word from the voice of God came down from heaven. That was the epiphany that day. And so uh, Jesus was pointed out as a, as a very special person. He was God also. He was God's son. Because he was God's son, he was God. And so at this, this story really helps 
the, the Peter, James, and John to see what their work was because they, they wanted to build a booth and stay there because it was so wonderful to be with Jesus. But what did Jesus say? He said, go back down the mountain and listen to the people. He said, don't tell anyone what you've seen here. So this was when Jesus began to first talk about how he would be giving his life, how he'd be suffering, and how he'd be dying for all the people. So this was a way of getting to know even more and more who Jesus was and what his purpose was for all of us. Jesus came to die, and he came, and God, what happened on Easter Sunday? God raised him up, right, from his grave. And because Jesus was raised up from the grave, when all of us die someday, what's the promise? If we believe that Jesus is God's son, we will also be raised to live forever. How about that? To forever with Jesus in heaven. Okay? <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the one who loves us and cares for us and shepherds us every day of our lives. Thank you for your love for us and your promise that you will keep us always as your own and care for us and have us with you in heaven on that day after we have died. Bless us, Lord. Bless us this day. Bless our worship here today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thanks, kids, for coming up. We hear God's voice in the Bible, in preaching, in music and prayer. Listen for God's voice in these readings. The first is found in 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. To honor the risen Christ in our midst, we stand for this reading from the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and he led them up a high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes were dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from that cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until the Son of Humanity has risen from the dead. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to all of you from the one who has risen from the dead. 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do you know what is the best and yet the worst at the same time? Cliffhangers, right? It's like getting to the end of book two in a great series where one needs to wait for book three a year later to come out to find out what the rest of the story is. Mom, just one more chapter, please. My boys beg me every night, right? It's not just an adult problem to want to know the end of the story. A couple of weeks ago, book three in a series I've been reading finally came out after a year after I read book two. And I realized that I didn't remember everything that had happened in books one and two. So I had to go back and reread part of it so I could be ready to go, oh yeah, that's right, in what comes around in book three. In our gospel reading today, it's like we're in book two of three. In the greatest story the world has ever known. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Full stop. <laughs> what comes next? <laughs> right? What does this rising from the dead mean? Chapter 9 in Mark is a pinnacle place in the story of Jesus, both literally and figuratively, and yet it is this in-between place, a liminal space, where there is a tipping point, right? where the tide is about to turn and this momentum will move him to a place that gives us all salvation. And to gain perspective, we need to go back and reread some things. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River. Jesus did not need to wade in the water with sinners for a baptism of repentance, but he did. He shows the world that he identifies with and loves sinners. Through chapter 1 in the story, we learned in Jesus' baptisms that the heavens are torn open, ripped apart, and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. And we hear a voice from the heavens, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And then we have these next eight chapters in the Gospel of Mark witnessing story after story of Jesus healing people, eating with them, inviting them into the kingdom of God, forgiving their sins. And in chapter 8, Jesus pulls aside his closest followers to teach them a very important lesson. Verse 31 says this, Then Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Wow, right? Peter really doesn't like that. <laughs> he doesn't like what Jesus has to say. He doesn't want to listen to him, so much so that he rebukes Jesus, a very strong word, rebukes Jesus, and Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Ooh, Peter is in trouble, right? And Jesus tells him, Peter, you are setting your mind on human things, not on divine things. And he this continues his teaching in verse 34. And we know this verse, right? If any want to become my followers, let them pick up their cross and follow me. Mark, as a skilled author, and Jesus, as a loving teacher, foreshadow what is to come. And we are to pay attention. Even if Peter doesn't like what Jesus just had to say, he follows him up that mountain anyway, right? He is trying, he's following, along with James and John into chapter 9. And we are on the mountain with them and somehow get this peek into this incredible scene and what it means, who Jesus really is, and what he is about. Mountains in scripture 
are thin places where this veil between heaven and earth is real thin <laughs> or it completely lifts, where there's somehow this overlap of human and divine. If any of you have been to Ireland, they have so many stories about these thin places where somehow you encounter something that is so powerful and you know it's of God, but you can't quite explain it. This story on the mountain is one of those. A mountain is where Moses is given the Ten Commandments, right? And Elijah, on the side of a mountain, as he is on the run for his life, hears the voice of God, right, in the silence, in the still small voice. And so it's the bearer of the law, Moses, and the prophet Elijah, who show up to just chit-chat with Jesus on top of the mountain. And then something more happens as Jesus is transformed or transfigured before them. We don't know exactly what this means. We're just told that his clothing became a dazzling white. The Greek word that gets translated as transfigured is metamorphose. What do you hear in that? Right? Metamorphosis, right? And metamorphosis, the definition of it, is to change or to cause to change completely in form or nature. Right? So Mark tells us that the disciples are what? Terrified. <laughs> and rightly so. And what do human beings do when they're afraid? They say silly things. They bumble. There might be nervous laughter to try and make sense of what's really going on. And Peter does this, right? He offers to make three mini homes. Two for people long gone. <laughs> and one for someone who they're just discovering maybe they don't know all that well in the first place. But it goes deeper than this, right? It says, Peter didn't know what to say. I think that's true, but I, I think there's something more to it. Because Peter just heard Jesus saying, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. And Peter doesn't want this to happen. He loves Jesus. And Peter's scared. And so Peter said, well, why don't we just make a little place for us to stay? right here on this mountain, Jesus, then maybe you don't need to suffer and die, right? We could stay here, and it'll be good. And so it's going to take a voice from God <laughs> to set the disciples straight, a cloud which indicates the presence of God all throughout Scripture descends on the mountain. And along with the disciples, we hear this voice of God Again, right? This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Right? Like, Peter, listen to him. Right? People of God, listen to him. And this word in Greek, this listen, has this ongoing sense. Keep listening to Jesus in an ongoing way. This is my son. This is God in the flesh with you, right in front of you. Continually listen to what he has to say, even if you don't want to hear it. Sometimes we need to hear and do hard things in order for new life to come. Peter wants the shortcut. He wants to skip over the hard parts of the story that include suffering and death. Don't we too? All the time, right? If Jesus is really God, he can't possibly be headed to the cross. That's not right. So for Peter and the rest of the disciples, they need to keep turning the page, putting one foot in front of the other, following their Lord so they could discover what comes next. And so when this cloud lifts, they see no one there anymore, but only Jesus. 
And I think that's gospel right there. (laughs) Only Jesus. And isn't that what we need every day? More than everything, anything in the whole world is only Jesus. Don Jewell, on his commentary on Mark, writes this about the transfiguration. The transformation affords only a brief glimpse of Jesus' heavenly status and destiny. The experience is over as quickly as it began. The disciples are left with Jesus. Not the Jesus resplendent in glory, but the one baptized by the, by, in the Jordan by John, indistinguishable from sinners and tax collectors, but the man with whom they ate and slept. They might have wished for more, but they do have Jesus with them, and he will accompany them to the valley where a different kind of reality awaits them. Jesus submits to this gravitational pull back down the mountain and into the valley where the suffering ones are deep in need of forgiveness and healing. Peter, James, and John do listen to Jesus as they pick up their cross and trudge back down the mountain into the valley with their Lord. They are trying really hard to follow. There's much they don't know, but they do know that Jesus is with them and that he loves them. And that is enough. And so right off the, mount, right off the mountain in chapter 9, Jesus encounters a man who is begging for the life of his child who suffers from seizures. And I wonder, could Jesus hear the cry of the parent for their child if he stayed up on that mountain? And so gravitational love continues its work, pulling Jesus to Jerusalem, to the cross, to the reality of his suffering and death. And it is in the cross in which we are deep into the last series, right, of the book. As Jesus dies for you and me, the temple curtain, that's this divide between human and divine, is torn in two, Mark tells us. And like these, the heavens were ripped apart at Jesus' baptism. And this common thread of declaration of identity comes from a surprising character who enters onto the scene at the last moment from an enemy and a murderer's lips, the Roman centurion sees Jesus die, and he witnesses, confesses, truly, this man was God's son. For many who witnessed Jesus' death, they believed that was it. Just death. Awful death. They may have believed that the resurrection of the dead was real and true, but they believed that it would happen at the end of the age, at the end of time. No one, no one believed that they would see Jesus rise from the dead in the middle of time, and they would be witnesses to it. In Feasting on the Word, Stanley Saunders writes, only after Jesus is crucified and raised can the disciples comprehend that a new world is coming into being, where the threat of death no longer dominates human imagination, and where God's Son liberates those who follow his path to the cross. There's no way they could know or comprehend or understand what Jesus meant with that cliffhanger, right? that Jesus was rise from the dead, right? Sometimes we can't wait to find out what happens at the end, so we flip ahead. I don't know if you do this, but I have friends who do, who just flip to the end of the book before they even start and read the last few pages because they really can't wait to know what happens, right? Some of you might be completely horrified right now. I'm not one of those, but I think, right, we can do that today as we flip to the end of the Gospel of Mark, right, in chapter 16. And as we turn to the last page, we have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome are bringing spices to anoint Jesus' body at the tomb. Spoiler alert, right? 
the stone was rolled away, the tomb was empty, and they see a figure dressed in white, right? You can hear that echo of the mountain, who is a messenger from God who says this to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He is not here. He has been raised. He has been raised. Dear people of God, Jesus Christ has been raised. He has been raised from the dead for you so that you may know that death is not the end so that you may know that God's love is far greater for you than anything you can commit. Christ has been raised so that you may know that new life is possible in any and every situation here in this life. God's story in Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, continues in and through you and through this church, and through our synod, and throughout the world. The end of the Gospel of Mark isn't really the end of the story. There are more chapters being written all the time. Your life, your story, this church, its story, our continued unfolding narratives. And like any good story, there are certainly times of trial and tribulation, of self-discovery, growth, and perseverance. So right now, your church is in a time of transition, right? Of liminal space and in-between time. Transition is a normal part of the life of a congregation. Yes, it's uncertain, right? But it's also a time of self-discovery as you trust in the one who holds and guides you. Like Peter, when we're scared and we don't know what is going to happen, we try and skip over the hard stuff, right? We just want to get to something that feels normal and right. Yeah? Or we want to keep and build tents, right? We want to keep everything the way that it is, right? But Christ is leading you through the hard stuff, not around it, through it. Because, beloved ones, there is no resurrection without death. And we have a God who knows what to do with death. God in Christ Jesus is making all things new, here and now, Yet there are, even though there are these unknowns ahead of you, there always are. <laughs> there are always unknowns in life. Know that we're here to accompany you. <laughs> Let us cling to what we do know, right? God is faithful. We know this. Christ is with you. He has promised you this as you keep putting one foot in front of the other, following Jesus. That's all you're asked to do. Follow me, our Lord says. God says, listen to him. The Spirit is with you as you do your best to listen. What is Jesus saying to you? In God's story, we all have an ongoing series, and isn't it exciting? How is the Spirit writing your next chapter as individuals and as a congregation? What does Christ's death and resurrection mean to you and your life? How is his love and forgiveness changing you and strengthening you? Who is Jesus Christ for you today? These are important questions. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, is alive. He loves you and is with you. Listen to him and keep writing the story. Thanks be to God.
May our response to the word proclaimed be our confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as you are able. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Tower of refuge and strength. 
As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. We pray for the church, that the transformational power of God enters the hearts of all people. May its leaders serve as examples of your grace and healing across time and place. God of grace, God of wisdom and love, we ask for your blessing upon our volunteers who faithfully serve this congregation. Bless us in our shared ministry and fill us with the transformative power of your spirit so that we might be a light to our community and the world. God of grace, God of the ages, bless our children and those who teach them the stories of your love and grace. Bless the educational ministry of our congregation. Fill the hearts of our Sunday school and confirmation teachers with joy as they pass along the faith that unites us all. God of grace, God of mercy, we pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Be with those hospitalized this week and with those requesting our prayers. Eldon Nelson, Casey Pirang, Brian Gevick, John Lyon, and with those we name in our hearts before you. God of grace, trusting that all the saints, prophets, and those who die in faith are held in your care, we remember in thanksgiving those who have died especially the family of Joyce Erickson as they mourn her death, and Sandra and Tom Henry upon the passing of Sandra's brother Mark. Grant us your gift of salvation as we await your coming again in glory. God of grace, God of new life, we give you thanks for the gift of the life promised to Reese Reagan Rungi through the waters of holy baptism this weekend. Please bless her as she grows in her understanding of your love for her through the coming years. God of grace, knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us receive our morning offering.
Now that we see what the people of God have gathered, please pray with me for these gifts. When we evaluate the needs of our families, of your church, of this world, we panic, for we do not have the time or the energy or the generosity to faithfully meet every need. God, help us trust that you will work through every gift of your people, give to accomplish your lasting change, your lasting peace, your lasting hope. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. Before you were born in the person of Jesus, God, you looked on all the earth as the people who fade like grass, and you loved them in your everlasting way. When the time was just right, you were born a holy child and placed in a manger. The child grew into a leader who fed and taught both friend and foe. You treated human disease with human urgency, and you showed us your enduring, everlasting love. Then the leader became the servant who knelt at the feet of his friends. And in the very night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks for it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks and blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of this. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught those first disciples, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever, amen. God, now the gifts are on the table now your people have come hungry, yet you are here now in bread and wine. These gifts of your presence, these messages of your love. Now, Holy Spirit, feed our spirits so that we may grow hungry for everyday justice and feed the world with everlasting kindness. Now, people of God, come to the table to adore the God who loves you. you may be seated.
Thank you for joining us in worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more information about Our Saviors, please visit our website at oslchurch.com and like us on Facebook. We invite you to join us again next Sunday morning. Until next time, may God's abundant love and blessings empower you to share the good news of Jesus Christ.